Sarah Van Hoff. I'm the, one of the trustees of the Woodbury Community Library. And we have Myrna um, Miranda O'Neill, who is our library director. I just want to welcome you tonight and thank the folks from ORCA who are Montpelier Public Television there in the back. And thank the Conservation Commission for working with us to set this up. And I'm going to let Paul Council introduce George tonight. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, thanks. Great. Well, thanks for braving the cold and coming out. This is nothing compared to what we were experiencing 13,000 years ago. Uh, good point, good point. <laughs> uh, George is a friend that I've known for quite a while. Oh. He's a research assistant professor at the geology department in Norwich, and he's a oh. charter member of the Upper Winooski Field Naturalists in oh. Marshfield. And we've been poking around together with uh, some other naturalists down that way for, geez, I don't know, 25 years now, maybe? Oh, 30. more like 30, yes. <laughs> I've come to recognize George as a, a real font of knowledge, and we're lucky to have him here tonight to talk about the glaciers and what they left behind. And George has probably dug more holes in Woodbury than all of us here combined, <laughs> and has a pretty good idea what's happening under the soil and among the rocks. So we'll let him uh, tell us about how it got to be that way. Thank, thanks a okay. lot, George. OK, thank you, Paul. Yeah. So um, how, how's the level sounding? You're hearing me OK? OK, great. Thank you, folks. Um, I want to make sure you understand this is this is meant to be an informal talk. If you have a question along the way, uh, just uh, raise your hand. Speak up. Uh, I, I want to make sure things are understandable to you. I I do tend to talk as a scientist a lot, but uh, hopefully we can keep it fun and interesting. Um, and so. Before we start with the slides, I want to ask you folks a couple of questions. I'm curious, uh, uh, let's see, are most of you from Woodbury? Is everybody from Woodbury here? Okay. All right. Most. Uh, These two guys are interlopers. Okay. Glad to have any of you. Where are you folks from? Just That's okay. This is really okay. Yes. Stop right there on the line. <laughs> Among other reasons that it's okay is um, a lot of my work up in Woodbury was done making a geologic map of the Woodbury quadrangle, the topographic map, and Callus makes up a large part of that map. But in town boundaries anyway, so it all connects together. Uh, but another question is, uh, how many of you have a garden? here, or a garden somewhere. Okay. And how many of you, when you dig a hole in your garden, you hit a lot of stones along the <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it might not be true, but you probably live on what's called glacial till, and you'll hear more about that. And how many of you get nice sand or silt or something like that in the natural soil where you have your garden? Okay, sometimes nobody's hand plays up, but that's good. All right, that could be something other than glacial till. It might be glacial lake deposits. So, in a sense, and we'll, get, we'll let these folks get settled. Uh, um, you all have already been making observations on what's called superficial geology. Uh, that's the study of the deposits that are on top of the bedrock. So, you all have seen some superficial geology already. Right? Anytime you dig a hole around you. Uh, all right. Well, looks like we've got enough chairs for folks. Right, so, um, we'll see all those slides on that first one uh, once we get going. Um, can we dim some of the lights without making it pitch dark in here? <laughs> is, there a, is there a way? We can work with this if we need to. Oh, that's better. Is that yeah, okay. okay with folks? Yeah. Okay. If it's too dark, <coughs> say so. And we'll set it, We'll do something else. I don't want because no, my slides will vary. Okay. So 
We're not going to go through all this stuff here on this slide. This is a slide to show you the geologic time scale with the age of the Earth at 4.5 billion years at the bottom and the present up at the top. And the only part that we're going to talk about here in this presentation tonight is the very top, the last 1.8 million years or so, because that's called the Quaternary Period, and it's subdivided into the Pleistocene, the time of glaciation, and the Holocene, which is the modern time. And the word anthropos Anthropocene is being used to describe the most recent time where humans are heavily influencing um, the course of, uh, of the Earth's uh, history. Uh, so, we're going to ignore all of this, and that means we're not going to talk about what the bedrock is like in various places, the rock types, and the, all the events that went into plate tectonics and the formation of Vermont. So pretend you're not interested in dinosaurs <laughs> or uh, marine fossils or the evolution of life on Earth or anything like that. Pretend you don't care about that, because we don't have time. So just the top. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the, the glaciation came about, but suffice it to say that 18 to 25,000 years ago, um, all of the northern parts of the world were heavily influenced by glacial ice. There were huge ice caps over North America, Greenland, uh, Europe, uh, parts of northern Asia, and the earth was, oh, and, and across Antarctica, the ice was much more extensive than it is now. Um, so, so there was a, a very cold time, coming to the end of a couple million years worth of cold periods, punctuated by warm periods. So um, the earth was starting to warm up, and the ice was melting, and starting to leap behind the deposits that we see in Vermont today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, sometimes I'm going to show you graphs, and I'll try and point out what the different directions mean. And this is a good first one. Um, this is years before the present, going from 16,000 years ago, like 14,000 BC, to 10,000 years before the present. And this is a graph of, of uh, global temperature. And when it's down below this line, it's much cooler. And when it's above this line, it's much warmer. And down here, we're going from uh, the end of the glacial, glacial time, when the ice sheets were widespread across the Earth. And there was a warming and a little blip of a cooling, and a warming, and a pretty good cooling, and then it cooled a bunch, and then it warmed abruptly in a matter of decades, is what they keep finding as they dive into it, into the beginning of our modern Holocene time. And the glaciers melted like crazy in this time here. Um, from 12,000 on through 10,000 years ago. And, um, all of Vermont was ice-free before we reached the right-hand end of that graph, but parts of northern, uh, northern Quebec where it still had an ice cap on them. <coughs> so it, it's just a measure of how <coughs> an abrupt climate change that occurred on the, on the Earth. So that was a graph that showed one thing plotted on another. Now we've got a map of um, New England with uh, oh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Here's Cape Cod. Here's Long Island down here, going up into Maine. Here's the here's the Vermont Quebec border, Quebec. And uh, this is a this shows where the glacial ice was at different times. So. Between 28 and 23,000 years ago, the ice was down at Long Island. Long Island is there because it's built of glacial moraines. 
glacial um, deposits formed out at the limits of where the glaciers got to. Amazing and, that it was called Long Island even back then. It, it, it could have been. It would have been a good name for it. <laughs> right. um, however, when it formed, uh, this was a this was not ocean because the uh, the uh, waters were all locked up in the ice and uh, the sea level was vastly lower, <coughs> much lower, over 100 meters, 140 meters lower than the present present day. So change was coming. The climate was warming, like I showed you on that graph. This dramatic warming, it, and this was even before the dramatic. Warming. So the ice progressively retreated through uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts and uh, from southern New Hampshire and Vermont. And by the time we got up to us around here, we were right about 14,000 years ago. So uh, that was before that truly big abrupt warming that, that basically destroyed most of the rest of the ice that was blanketing. North America. What did they think caused that? Um, there's several combined causes. The, the, main, the best explanation comes from a set of changes in the Earth's orbit. And I have a slide where I can talk about that at the end. But the, how, how, how elongate the Earth's orbit is, how much the pole is tilted from uh, from the plane of the of the Earth's orbit, and uh, how much it's spinning around like a top. So those three factors go together to explain a lot of this change. Uh, but so so we had glacial ice retreating and leaving evidence, which we'll talk about, um, and that. <coughs> It's a major factor, that, that ice retreat is a major factor in influencing the superficial deposits, the sand and gravel and clay and other materials left behind in Woodbury. Um, I wanted to start, I'm sort of going to go and come from Woodbury and talking about Vermont in general. But here's a topographic map of Woodbury. Um, here's the uh, here's South Woodbury. Um, Sabin Pond, Greenwood Lake, Route 14 going through here. Here's Hardwick up here. And so you'll see these maps again and again of different forms. This is your basic topographic map with contour lines that give us a good sense of, of <coughs> relative elevations. And for years, uh, geologists would work with maps like this, like the USGS topographic maps you might use for hiking hunting, that sort of thing. Um, and they tell us a lot. They, they're essential, it's essential to have some sort of an accurate map in order to do my work, to, to map one, one site relative to another. Where's the sand? Where's the gravel? Where's the limit to a lake deposit? Um, but increasingly, we're using newer maps these days. And this is, this is a map made of from laser topographic data that we have for all of Vermont. And what it shows you, uh, beyond showing the, the lakes in, in the same way, here's Sabin Pond, Greenwood Lake, here's uh, Route 14 winded through here, County Road comes up through here. Um, beyond that, it shows us with huge, uh, incredible detail, areas that are fairly flat, and they're showed as white, and areas that are steep, and they're showed as dark. You can't see much on this one, but I'll, but I'll zoom in on a, another map, and you can start to see this incredible detail. Like, okay, here's Sabin Pond, Route 14. I just drove up Route 14 and wound around, and I, I drove over that little flat white area. That's the delta from this brook that comes in here. There's a wetland there. Um, Route 14 going up this way. Um, all of this stuff on the map that's lined up here is ridges of bedrock. And ridges as small as, say, three or four feet high and 20, 10, 20 feet long. 
I can easily see them on, on this sort of uh, map. So it gives me incredible information. For one thing, it tells me that Woodbury is a rough place to, to uh, do farming. Because <laughs> there's, every time you see a little dark line on here, it means there's a steep ridge that you'd either have to clamber over or climb over. Right? It, it's really showing things, you know, the size of this table and upward show up on these maps. It's kind of overwhelming. Um, so that's one of the tools we use these days when we start to puzzle out the geology. I actually didn't have maps like this available to me in 2015 when we were doing our geologic mapping here. But we had to get along without it. And then here, a little further north, here's... I'm sorry, I'm using the official names as opposed to the names that a lot of people use. So I forget. There's Greenwood Lake, there's Valley Lake, and what do, what do we call Valley Lake? Dog. 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 Yeah, I get confused. And here's Buck Lake over here. And if you've ever, for example, hiked around Buck Lake at all, <laughs> this dark line down here, that's those big cliffs there. And this dark line along here, that's those, those cliffs over on that side. Um, and uh, here's the Cabot Road. And this is the quarry, up near the granite quarry. It shows up like a sore thumb. <laughs> so anyway, so, so it's a powerful tool we have to look at the landscape. Now, this, I'm going to move away from this in a second. This is what we get when we make a uh, surficial geologic map. It's too messy to really go through right now, but I, I'm going to start to explain what these maps show. So this is the area around Sabin Pond and Forest Lake? What's that called? That's um, Dog Pond? Nelson Pond. Nelson. 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 Nelson Pond. And Number 10 Pond. Yeah. And there's um, Dog Pond. Uh, Dog Pond. Dog Pond. And then, we do agree on Greenwood Lake? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was there an old name for that one, too? No, I... Pretty much green? Yeah. Way back when it was called Long Pond. Long Pond. Right. West Long Pond. West Long and East Long Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, anyway, so, um, so there they are for orientation. And then these different colors are the different types of superficial materials that, that we encountered as we did this mapping. And I'll zoom in on that, and I'll show you that on other simpler maps. And all these red arrows are glacial striations that are scratches made in the rocks as the glacial ice passed over them. And it tells us which way the glacial ice was moving. And those are, those are very important. Uh, but again, other maps will show it better. For example, this map, I took away all those, most of the colors. And you can still see glacial ice moving from sort of north to south, or sometimes from northwest to southeast. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then there's this area outlined in blue with a kind of a greenish uh, hint to it. These are glacial lake deposits, and we'll definitely talk more about that. And then down through here, there's a set of purple lines, short purple lines, from Dog Pond down through um, uh, Sabin. Yeah, Sabin. Sabin. These purple lines are esker deposits, E-S-K-E-R. Those are glacial stream deposits. We'll, we'll get back to that, but they tell us the way the meltwater was flowing near the edge of the ice as it was melting away about 14,000 years ago. So, so these different things I'm showing on the maps are clues to the glacial history of the area. Um, how can you tell with those red um, arrows, how can you tell oh. which direction the ice is traveling when you ah, see that? On the I don't have a photo that'll show that perfectly. No, I, actually, I do have, I'll get to that in just a moment. I think a, a couple slides are on. Um, 
So now I, I put the, uh, the colors on and left out most of the, uh, the other stuff. Um, this kind of, uh, whatever you call that color, yellowish, mustard, whatever that color. This, this dominant color on the map is glacial till. So that's this mix of gravel and sand and boulders that underlies most of Woodbury, most of central Vermont, most of Vermont overall is glacial till or bedrock. Um, and there's bedrock scattered all through here. We're not even trying to show it on a map like this. And then these purple deposits are what are called ice contact deposits. It's sand and gravel that was deposited basically right up against the glacial ice without being moved much. And then there's some blue things that aren't lakes up in here that are glacial lake deposits. And those are anything from sands to silts and clays formed in lakes that temporarily filled our valleys as the ice melted. So we'll, we'll get back to that too. Um, and here's a close-up around Sabin Pond. Uh, I had to change the coating, but this red line is the upper limit of what we know about the, where the glacial lake came to. There's a little hint of it up here, but basically we have the Esker, the glacial stream deposits coming down into Sabin Pond and getting in, in a wider zone of sand and gravel deposited adjacent to the ice. This, this was formed as the glacial ice margin was right about here, retreating into here. So these deposits record the last days of the, of the, the ice. And this blue is an arm of the big glacial lake that filled the Winooski Valley and its tributaries. So I'll talk more about that. Now, moving towards the striations that you mentioned. But first, here's another way we, we take the data and look at it. Now I've, now I've made a slice through the lands, uh, landscape. I'll try not to stand in front of you too much. I, I kind of like to point at it rather than use the mouse. But um, this dark black line is the land surface. And, and that's what your topography looks like. It's actually quite exaggerated. So. Um, it's, um, it's probably a couple miles across from, from the left to the right. And it's only uh, a few hundred feet. What is it? The land surface only goes from, oh, maybe 900 feet to 1,400 feet above sea level, so 500 feet in elevation. So if I don't put any exaggeration on the land, it, it basically looks like just a little dip, and I can't show you the different um, surficial deposits. So underneath Sabin Pond, based on water wells and other observations, we think there's pretty thick deposits on the order of, oh, as much as a much as a hundred feet thick in places, but then rapidly thinning to the sides. In most of our hills across Vermont, you can't even show the thickness of the glacial till because it's probably 10 feet or less. Anywhere where you can actually see ledge sticking up, well, there isn't any surface here. Okay. Um, all right. So I think this is the last of the surficial geologies. And, oh, yeah. What I did is I wanted to show you the. Uh, these esker deposits, these glacial uh, glacial stream deposits, uh, are seen in several places from, from Valley Lake on down all the way to Sabin Pond sporadically. Um, all right. So this is an example of some glacial striations. These are scratches in the rock. And um, and many times we can see the shape, the rock has been scratched, but it's also been shaped. Um, in, this, in this case here, this is a big ledge of bedrock in here. 
with the ice. That's the north side. This is the south side. It's very gentle on the north side, and it's very <coughs> steep and abrupt on the south side. You can't even tell how abrupt. It just drops right off there. And the glacial ice moved from north to south plucking away at the south side as it went. What happens is the pressure of the ice is really high at the north side, and as it passes over the rock and moves past, the pressure is a lot lower. And there's water at the bottom of the glacial ice. It's, it, the glacier is flowing on a bed of water under great pressure. And it's, when it, under pressure, it stays, um, it stays liquid, but when it reaches a zone of low pressure, like down here, it freezes and it cracks the rock apart, and then it gets torn away. And we see these uh, these formations called roche moutonnées all over the state. And if you look at Camel's Hump, yeah, it's a steep south face and a very gentle north face. It's basically a very large scale version of one of these indicating the overall direction of motion. And there's some fine scale features that we can see of how uh, quartz veins and other things get abraded or not. There, there's several other ways we can tell the direction of ice motion. But just, that's part of the reason we look at them so closely. And this crazy map, all those red arrows are places where we have data on how the glacial ice moved. And this goes all the way from Bradford and St. Johnsbury up to Hardwick. This is your quadrangle. Uh, there's uh, Woodbury Mountain, Sabin Pond, and the Winooski River Valley, Waterbury, Montpelier, Barrie, Northfield. No, sorry, Northfield, Waitsfield. And we've got thousands of glacial ice measurements. And they show various patterns that mean various things. Uh, most of the glacial ice, for most of the Pleistocene, was moving from the northwest to the southeast, carrying ice out of Canada, out of Quebec, <coughs> down through our region. If, if you go other, other ways, it sweeps around in a uh, different fashion. Uh, we should have another slide coming up that shows the, this, the, the big picture. Not sure what happened to that, but that's okay. Um, and then as the ice was really wasting away because the climate was warming, the ice was getting thinner, it was still being pushed down from Canada for a long time because it was still cold up there. Snow fell in Canada every year, accumulated, uh, got thicker and thicker, pushed outward, and made this ice keep moving down here in Vermont. But it was thinner, and it was more and more controlled by where the valleys were, so that we had late stages of ice that was streaming down through the Winooski Valley and getting turned by the, the north-south grain of a lot of our, our valleys. So the ice started moving more in the Woodbury area, more from north to south, just right down the Kingsbury Branch, say, as opposed to heading over towards Bradford quite so much, or, or a Barnet or somewhere like So there that. already were like hills and valleys. It wasn't that the glaciers oh, yeah, shaped yeah. all of those. They, they partially shaped, but it was already shaped there. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you look at the big topography of Vermont, before three million years ago, before the climate had even um, started to cool very much from the warm times and the earlier uh, years, are, you would recognize the shape of Vermont. The, the hills and valleys were roughly where they were. The glaciers uh, definitely shaped our landscape, but when you think what streams did over the previous, oh, oh just the previous 50 million years <laughs> before the glaciers came along, streams working on the landscape are what really shaped it. And then the glaciers are kind of polishing and, and sandpapering. Wow. But the streams operate over such a longer time period that, that they're what give us the, the main shape of everything in Vermont. 
Not that the Lake Willoughby Notch wasn't scoured out by glacial ice coming through it, things like that. But where the Green Mountains were and all, that goes back long before. That's a really good point. Okay, so, so this is glacial till. It's a typical example. That's an excavation. It, it's, an old, it's a sand and gravel pit over in Groton State Forest, and I'm, I'm uh, looking at the material there. And it, it's, it's sandy material, but a mix of stones of every size up, and, up to boulders. I don't know. And many times they're as big as this room or larger, but um, certainly full of a wide range of grain sizes. And that material <coughs> is uh, directly the result of melting of glacial ice that had stopped moving, and, it, and the climate was too warm, it, it, the ice stopped moving, and it melted in place. And when you melt a half a mile of ice or whatever, at the thickest it was a mile thick and, and more in places, uh, you melt a half a mile of ice, and some of it's going to flow off, but some of it just sort of, the material just settles down in, in place, and then you get this sort of unsorted material like that. There's, it doesn't have lots and lots of big layers of all the boulders in one layer, all the, the cobbles in another. Uh, there are other settings where we get those layers. Here's, here's some over in uh, West Topsom area. Again, um, you know, here's pebbles and very fine sand all mixed together. Uh, that's a characteristic of glacial uh, till deposits, not uh, river deposits or lake deposits. And here's a, that's about a 25 foot high exposure, um, a, a stream bank um, landslide on Great Brook in Plainfield. And have any of you driven up the Brook Road in Plainfield? Yeah, yeah it, there's landslides all along there. The reasons are, there's a whole other talk on why there are landslides on Great Brook and what their characteristics are, but they're among the most dramatic in the state. And this glacial till is sometimes so sandy, the, the ones I showed you before, you can reach your fingers in and sort of pull, pull some out easily. This stuff has a lot of silt in it, and it's very dense. And these chunks here are not boulders, they're pieces of the till that had broken off in the, the May 2011 flood, and some of them were swept downstream quite a ways and not destroyed. They were like rounded up a bit, made into boulders by being rolled along by the stream. These are real boulders, these are rocks, you know, hard stuff that you would, would uh, you could hit with a hammer and they'd still be, you know, that's a, basically a gravel bar. But this glacial till is so strong uh, in, in some places, so hard that uh, even in a stream it doesn't break down right away. And uh, here's an excavation over at uh, Susan and Dave Sawyer's. Uh, they were putting in a foundation for their, their son's place. Um, and that's typical glacial till. It's silty, sandy material with a wide range of, of cobbles, or pebbles, cobbles, boulders in there. Um, and then, of course, our landscape is studded with, with uh, boulders, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 feet across. You know, name a size and I can find you one. Uh, that, and you've got plenty in, in Woodbury, it's just my Boulder pictures happen to not be from Woodbury, but you know, that one, Close, he's that one uh, is in the town of Woodbury, I think. It's over on the west side of East Long Pond, so I think you get that one. Um, but, uh, you know, dramatically large pieces of granite plucked off of ropes of mountain up to the north, probably, would be my guess. And, uh, all right. Now we're back to these eskers. They're really crazy features. And sometimes it's very hard to photograph them. Like the Woodbury ones, I don't really have a good photo just because they're in the woods and it's always kind of tight. But it's basically a, an elongate, serpentine ridge of sand and gravel. Um, 
either they're often 10 to 20 feet or more high, and they can be thousands of feet long in places. There's, there's ones up in, up in uh, northern uh, Quebec that uh, go for miles, and in Maine, miles and miles. The ones around here tend to stop and start. Yeah, I wanted to get back to this map to re remind you where they are. Um, we found a line of them. Didn't find any up at Greenwood Lake, you know, and we missed things. There could be a piece up in here. And all the way down as far as Sabin Pond, we found discontinuous pieces of ridges, a sand and gravel ridge. In some places, it's been pretty mined out uh, for sand and gravel because it was a good source. So. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's nothing there to see sometimes, uh, except maybe on old maps. Um, and this tells us that, I may have another map that comes along, but this will do. This tells us that it, when these ridges formed, they only form under the glacial ice. What happens is there's a stream flowing under the ice making up a cavity. It, it's flowing water, it's getting concentrated in from the sides. The ice margin was down here at the southern end of, of Sabin Pond. <coughs> and this water was pouring off of, out of the glacial system. Um, there were probably other ones off to the west and east. Uh, taking the water, melting out under the ice, and bringing out into glacial Lake Winooski. Uh, let's see this more in a, another couple of slides. But. Has anyone ever seen one of these ridges before? Oh, yeah. Does this sound familiar? Yeah, absolutely. And, pretty yeah, spe and, and, and where, where did you see them? Did you can just call out. Southwood South Southwood, Bird. South Bird, yeah, yeah. Uh, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, there's lots. And all through Massachusetts. There's a big one around Lindenville. Oh, yes. Yeah, the Pasumpsic Valley, um, uh, Barnet, St. Johnsbury, Lindenville. That's one of the most dramatic um, esker systems in the state. Yeah, yeah. So there, um, this is something we're starting to put together. In the next year, we're trying to summarize all of this information for central Vermont, from St. Johnsbury over to Richmond in one big map. And it's quite exciting. And among other things, there'll be a map of all the Esker systems put together, not just one little piece. And there's a, there's a little gap in Sabin Pond. Uh, that's viewed from the sort of east, or there it is. East looking west, I think. So that little gap that you can boat through there, it's Esker on either side, the sand and gravel ridge. I think there might be some up around, um, just south, southeast of um, uh, Green Reservoir, Green River Reservoir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's some big Esker deposits up there, up around Norton, up in the far northeast kingdom, <coughs> over in Stowe, there's a spectacular. Esker in the Miller Brook Valley. So there, there's dozens of them scattered around Vermont, as you expect in any area where you had a lot of glacial meltwater going on. And this doesn't show it really well, but a lot of our swampy lowlands, like the, the big uh, peatlands over near Lanesboro in, in Groton State Forest, they're boulder floored former channels that the glacial meltwater was flowing on at the surface. And here's a couple of swales that have vernal pools in them now that are, are unconnected with any stream systems, but they once had large amounts of glacial meltwater flowing through them. Uh, there's thousands of those scattered around Vermont. Um, here's a steep one coming down from a hillside above East Long Pond. It's a very bouldery swale coming down like this. And that was a, that was a very brief, short-lived uh, glacial meltwater route as well. And here's one south of Buck Lake, kind of a, I 
it, it's just a big swampy area now, but based on the overall pattern of it, it's evidence of where the glacial ice was, waters were draining away. And in this photo over in Barnet, over near the Connecticut River, I'm standing in a big hollow in, in the bedrock formed by glacial meltwaters flowing over this gap in the ridge and making a whirlpool and with abrading this rock with boulders and cobbles and pebbles being swirled around and uh, it was basically a plunge pool type spot. That's at least a hundred feet above the Pasumpsic River today. There's, there's, no, there's no streams flowing through it anymore, but there, there was at one time. And George, this was happening under and within the ice. That one could have been out beyond the ice margin or under. I, I don't know. But the meltwater channels are often right near the edge. The eskers are out underneath the ice. Okay. Back in a little ways. So when you're talking about ice margin, yeah, yeah. you're talking about like the the lowest south that the glacier yeah. ever got? Or that it was at at a, a certain time. Mm -hmm. uh, Remember that map I showed of New England showing the line, the wiggly lines oh, across yeah, yeah, it? Yeah. So it was down at the bottom in, in uh, at Long Island over 20,000 years ago, and then retreating up to Vermont by 14,000 years ago, and northern Quebec by like 8,000 years ago. But, so on this map here, again, you can see Sabin Pond, you can see these segments of esker here in purple and in red down here, I didn't tell you that, but that's a delta from a, a, a stream that had been flowing into an arm of glacial lake Winooski. We had our, our glacial lake coming up into here and the esker shows us that the glacial ice was melting and pouring out. The waters from the melting under the ice was pouring out through here. And then it probably melted back up to here. And this piece of esker was feeding it. And then back up into here, year by year. Who knows, maybe it was one year, two years, three years, or 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But the ice was gradually retreating up from south to north because it wasn't being fed uh, from up above, uh, from up to the north anymore. You need a 3D animation on this, and I don't really have it yet. No, 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 no. All right, so that's my messy map anymore but, uh, that you've seen before, but maybe the colors are starting to make a little bit of sense on this. Um, I wanted to show you a few more features. Um, these both lumpy ridges out in the open there are what are called caves. They're sand and gravel lumps left uh, as the glacial ice was stagnating and melting. The water, the sediment wasn't deposited by flowing very much. It was basically stagnating around these areas um, and. Uh, wasting away. It's an indicator of a somewhat stagnant ice situation. These are just north of Nichols Pond. Is that from there? Yeah, we, have, uh, we have a whole bunch of those on our property, much bigger than that. Really? Where is that? Uh, bottom of Woodbury Gulf. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so, see, because sometimes I go and look at these ridges and it turns out I dig in them and it's bedrock there. You know, they, it just hit ledge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's great, but it's more interesting when we find, I find the sand and gravel deposit. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, here's an example of a kettle hole. This is over at the Neal Farm in South Woodbury. Um, it's a place where there was a block of glacial till or glacial ice, surrounded by sand and gravel. That's, over on the right is the sand and gravel, and where the pond is now was a block of glacial ice that largely melted away, leaving a hollow 
and because it was below the groundwater table, it becomes a pond. So you've got kettles scattered all over the, the, the valley portions of Woodbury. Do you have any any ponds like that on your property? Um, okay. Not really. Yeah. Although Sometimes I've seen a we, whole bunch of those down in southeastern Massachusetts. You would have. There there were the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. What towns are you thinking of there? Uh, these were in the town of Plymouth. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Plenty. Plenty of kettle holes down there. That's that's glacial geology yeah. central down there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so here's some sand and gravel deposits over in Walden. Um, and these deposits are layered, which means that the waters were flowing and changing in their energy. So um, some sort of glacial stream and very small pond deposits. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details on it, but quite thick. I mean, that's a 50-foot high bank there, sand and gravel. And uh, here's a slightly closer view of the material. That was Devlin, who was my field assistant back in 2016. He loved digging. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about glacial lakes here. Um, but also, let's see, how are we doing on time? Let's see, let's see the time check. Okay. Well, if people are okay, I'm going to go through a bit more. and. Um, take you on a little tour of our glacial lakes in Vermont. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. And what happened is that story that I've been repeating about the glacier, glacial ice retreating from, at, from the south to the <coughs> north over several thousand years. Um, there, there was a glacial lake in the Connecticut River Valley on the eastern side of the state that is quite extensive. And this map doesn't show it all. That lake formed because of a damming of the valley down at Rocky Hill, Connecticut. So the waters of the Connecticut River Valley were, were dammed by uh, some glacial deposits. And at first, the lake was very short, only taking up part of the Connecticut portion. But then the ice retreated up into Massachusetts, and the lake got longer. And the dam largely held. And the ice kept retreating up through Vermont. And that dam still held for, for something like 3,000 years or so. Um, and we have some very interesting ways of dating the deposits. I'm not really going to go into it. But there are some very precise analyses done of how long some of these lakes lasted. So, uh, Lake Hitchcock, so-called after an early geologist over in the Connecticut River Valley, is our longest lived one in Vermont. And then there's a series of lakes that formed over in the Champlain Valley. Um, and then a very large lake in the Winooski River Valley that actually connected through Stowe up into the Lamoille River Valley. And there's some others in other places that just aren't shown yet because we haven't made the maps. So we're working on it. So that's the map view of glacial lakes. And this is a funny chart that where we're trying to show that there were different lakes in the Champlain Valley, the Winooski River Valley and its tributaries, and over in the Connecticut River Valley. And, uh, Lake Hitchcock was the earliest, I think that's uh, 13,900 to 11,400 in, in Vermont, just, just in the Vermont range. And then we had a series of lakes that formed in the Winooski Valley, and I'll explain that. I've got a, some slides that show that pretty well. And then the Glacial Lake and what's called the Champlain Sea that filled the, the uh, Champlain Valley. That, there's an interesting pattern with those, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, all of them were relatively short-lived, except for Lake Hitchcock. And then I have Lake Champlain taking up a lot of space at the top. That's after the end of all this glacial stuff. So, so what is a glacial lake? Anyone been to Alaska? Paul's been, I know. Yeah. 
So anywhere that, where there's a glacier coming down into um, an area that might get restricted in some fashion, where the drainage might get restricted, a, a glacial lake can, can form. So here's a glacier in the background on the Kenai Peninsula. Um, and it's flowing this way. This ice is moving. Day by day, if you put some flags out on that ice in the summer and watch them, they'll be in a different position the next day, the next week, the next month. So that ice is moving and melting out here at the outer parts with icebergs breaking up. Well, there's some sort of glacial moraine out here that blocked it. That's an end, end deposit of a glacier. And then there's a barrier beach uh, made by shore processes by uh, the drift of the currents uh, depositing sand that's blocking up that lake there. So that's one way to form a glacial lake. Um, and another way is here. I, I showed you a picture of, here's the glacier, here's the lake, and I showed you a picture showing the, the barrier beach down here. Well, up glacier a ways, in a little side valley, there's this. That's a lake that is dammed up by the glacial ice because it goes up, up behind there, and waters are pouring in from the melting ice and maybe from rain and snow melt on the sides. And that stuff in front here, that's glacial ice. That's what it often looks like. It looks like dirt, because it's carrying a lot of dirt. It's probably more ice than dirt, but I'm sure it's messy stuff at times. So what's happening there is that lake is building up periodically and getting so high that it breaks out. And it looks like a little thing, but it's causing floods down in the lower lake, down in the bottom, down here. So um, they actually, I don't think they let people go in that lake anymore because it, the glacial surges are too dangerous. They don't know what's going to come, come roaring down through there um, uh, as far as big blocks of ice and masses of thousands of cubic uh, yards worth of water pouring through at a dramatic rate. So, um, so that's a tiny glacial lake. We have bigger ones. Vermont had some pretty good sized ones. And here in Woodbury, here's this map. It might even be the last time. Uh, Sabin Pond, uh, Greenwood Lake. And we had an arm of Glacial Lake Winooski coming up into here ending somewhere around here, not getting up into central Woodbury. And then, because the lake went all the way around through Stowe and came up through the, the um, Lamoille River Valley, it extended on up through the Gulf, part way up the Gulf, not all the way to Greenwood Lake. And there are some small deposits of silt clay. The best one. You had to be there. You know, you know the Dollar General? Yeah. Everybody knows the Dollar yeah. General? Yeah. The, when they put it in, they dug out the bank behind there, and there's beautiful glacial lake deposits for a few days. And a friend of mine called me, and I drove up, and I got to take some pictures of it, and then it's gone. It'll never be seen again, maybe. Crashed over or whatever. So that's the, the life of a geologist. You, know? <laughs> you don't move when you've got the exposure. You may, you may not have it. But I have the photos to prove it. But why I didn't show it, I don't know. I, I got that photo somewhere. All right. So we'll take a little better tour of these glacial lakes in the, in the Winooski Valley. And, and uh, I think it's probably. I'm going to wrap up after doing the Glacial Lake tour, I think. Then we'll see. But, okay, so this is an oblique view of showing um, where's Camel's Hump. Here's the Winooski Valley, as it's going to be. Here's uh, Williamstown and Northfield and the Dog River Valley, Mont uh, Montpelier, Barry, Woodbury. Oh, yeah, I can pick up Woodbury. Yeah, yeah Woodbury. There's Woodbury yeah. Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so Woodbury right up in here. We should have, wow. should have laid it there. Mm -hmm. so, that's so. All right.
But let's start a little earlier. This is the, imagine this light is the glacial ice. It's gotten up to central Vermont. Well, there's a ridge of hills going across here. Nowadays, the White River drains down here, the first branch of the White, the second branch. Um, uh, they drain to the south. Um, this is Williamstown Gulf. This is the Roxbury, I forget. Sometimes they call it rocks. Is it Cook? Yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah. Would it be Cookfield? What's that? Is it Cookfield? Oh. Goes down through there? I didn't. It's it basically it's, Where is it's that the different field? roads. Route 12, route. Brookfield is below Lake Williamstown. That okay. would be okay. Roxbury, Hancock, down Granville? Lake. Granville, yeah. Uh, this one's this one's Granville, and that's, that's well, that's Roxbury Village right there. And then that's the next <coughs> gulf over. I forget, don't, I forget what that was called. That was, was, anyway, so in each, the ice was to the north, and in each of these north-flowing stream valleys that predated the glaciers, um, Waters were impounded, just like that little glacial lake I, I showed you. They rose up until they were able to spill out and move southward into the White River Valley. So we had a series of separate glacial lakes that left behind some deposits, sand and gravel and silt and clay. And then the ice melted back further, so Montpelier is no longer under the ice, but it's underwater. And the same with um, Williamstown, Barry, Northfield, uh, Wakefield, Warren. They're, they're all underwater. Brookfield, well, you're still under the ice. So, uh, Plainfield's under the ice. Probably Marshfield at this stage on this one. Uh, but, but, um, so you already have a pretty large lake encompassing, you know, the, these valleys that we drive through today. And sand and gravel is being deposited on the margin, <coughs> silt and clay in the back. And then, okay, now here's the latest stage. Glacial ice is retreating over towards the Champlain Valley. There's still a lot of ice over there. UVM is underwater. <laughs> Middlebury is already out from under. But, but, but uh, uh, Burlington is under the ice still. And so these glacial lakes that existed for a little while up in the, these um, north flowing valleys have coalesced into a new lake that is still flowing out through um, Williamstown Gulf, because that's the low spot. The other gulfs are higher, and so they're not operating anymore. So waters are still flowing from this huge lake coming in from rain and snow melt and glacial melt waters and pouring out through here. Williamstown Gulf had huge amounts of water going through it for some, some uh, decades to centuries. And um, this is sort of the details of the fact that we, we look at shoreline deposits special places where we can see identifiable shoreline sand and gravel deposits, and they tell us where each of these lakes were. Um, and the surface that we get, a lake surface that would have been as level as a bathtub surface the day it formed, they're now tilted because the land had just been released or was being released from the weight of all this glacial ice and was tremendously pushed down. The land was submerged by hundreds of feet, and it's been rebounded. Um, the same process that's going on today up in northern Canada and uh, Scandinavia, places that have been more recently deglaciated, their land surface is measuring, is being uplifted so fast it's easy to measure. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so our, our landscape is, has responded to that. Um, it's, 
even today, 14,000 years after the glaciers have retreated, our landscape here in northern Vermont is, we think, still going up at a very subtle rate, but it's hard to measure. It's on the order of one to two millimeters a year, but you've got to have something to compare it to. <laughs> and so if, you, if, if a surveyor went out and measured between one point in Woodbury and a point in Callis every year, well, they might be shifting a little differentially, but how would you know? But with the most precise types of GPS positioning that surveyors use now, the very best, they can measure that sort of thing. And so it's being documented all over the northern regions. Um, uh, even rates of, of a millimeter a year over a decade or two, you can start to nail it down. Amazing. Um, this is a photo from, from Norway. I didn't take the photo, but I was here. It's a spectacular valley in, in the Jotunheimen Mountains. And here's a big lake in a glacially scraped out valley, big U-shaped valley. And streams are coming in at the, at the upper end, and the outlet's way down here. And they, these are delta deposits. Streams come down to the lake, and they slow down because their gradient has, has dropped and they drop their deposits. And delta deposits like that modern one are exactly what we look at to figure out these little glacial things. Here's a delta viewed from above. That's probably oh, several hundred feet across that field of view, formed by a, a delta at Cotton Brook on the, wa on the uh, west side of the Waterbury Reservoir, where there's a, a large landslide that, that was highly active in 2019. It's still active. Yeah. That's, that's a site we're, we're studying. Uh, but that's one of the most spectacular deltas I've seen in a while. Um, the deposits come right down. I mean, they grade right to the lake level. And if, uh, if Waterbury Reservoir was drained, and these, and these deposits were vegetated over and didn't erode away, you could come back 10,000 years from now and have a very good idea of what the level of Waterbury Reservoir was. Um, they're also very erodible, too. And, uh, so they may not be there in 10,000 years. <laughs> and this is... This is what some of these glacial lake deposits, this is Lake Hitchcock deposits in the upper Connecticut River Valley. And this is where the glacial lake level was. And these are deposits far out uh, when the, uh, these deposits hadn't yet pushed out over them. So these are, these are in the lake deposits and these are kind of more edge of the lake deposits that are building out over them. But it's just an example of how vast some of these glacial lake deposits can be. And they've been major sources of sand and gravel for the last century. That's another one in Maine. They're all over, quite spectacular at times. Oh, fancy one. And um, I'm going to wrap up on. Um, some of the other glacial lake deposits. These are a very complicated set of deposits here that we're not going to really dive into, but you can see that there's a very strong set of lines that go across here. But those lines represent layers, planes, like, like leaves in a book, like pages in a book stacked one on the other. And sometimes those layers can tell us a lot of really useful information. Um, Okay, dime for scale. Here's your dime. Little thing, size of my, smaller than my thumb. So those lines represent annual layers in, in glacial Lake Winooski. They're on the shore of the Waterbury Reservoir. That's the modern water body they're near. But uh, I'll show you another slide, but, but this one works well too. Um, there's white colored white layers and dark layers. You see them over and over again. And they form a pattern just as tree rings form a pattern where you can look at trees in a region and look at one tree after another. And if their growth conditions were the same, 
you can say, okay, I can figure out what year I'm looking at. Well, these layers called VARVs, V-A-R-V-E-S, um, it's a Swedish word, um, they can be mapped out. It's very painstaking work, work to, to measure them. But if they're measured and compared with other places and put in sequence and order, um, uh, you can figure out the year-by-year -year history. Because what happens is these are deposits that form deep in the glacial lake, far away from the edges, far away from those streams that make deltas, like those sand and gravel deposits I was showing you. Um, instead, in the summertime, out in the middle of the lake, uh, fine silt and sand can, can wash out. There are little currents, gentle currents, carrying that stuff out into the lake. And the waters are just a little bit in motion and keeping finer materials, silt and clay, suspended in them. So every one of those light colored layers is a summer layer. And then what happens with a lake in northern New England even now when it's winter time, what does the lake do? Freeze over. And that landscape used to freeze up so much that basically stream activity slows down to nil. Not entirely, there'd be some water flowing through some of the streams, but basically the lakes shut down the inputs to them. So there's no longer much sediment coming in. And Here's another site. Let's see. I have to get oriented. Okay, well, here's a good one. Here's a light colored layer. That's a summer layer. This darker layer is silt and clay. It's the finest stuff. It, it's so fine that you rub the silt just by itself. If you rub it between your fingers, you can feel it a little, but it basically gets lost in your fingerprints. It's really tiny stuff. The clay is so fine, if you get pure clay, you, you can lick it with your tongue and you can't even taste any grit. That's, you know, that's good stuff for pots. Do we have any ceramics folks here? Yeah, yeah. And, and you can tolerate a bit of that silt, I think. It depends what you're doing. Um, you don't want too much sand in there, I wouldn't think. Just the right amount? It depends on what you're making. It depends on what you're making, yeah. Well, this is pretty good pot stuff. I don't know about that, but you know, it depends, again, um, what the requirements are. But so these lake deposits have been studied throughout New England, starting in the 1920s, um, and we worked out a chronology for the glacial lakes. And then using things like radiocarbon dating, we've been able to tie those relative ages um, to absolute ages. So that's, that's how we made that, that map of New England showing the, uh, the age of when the ice, uh, uh, ice margin uh, was in different positions. Because these lakes followed the ice. You know, the water was pouring off. And uh, so basically, as the ice melted back, the lakes expanded after the this was a site that I looked at behind the, um, just behind and to the left of the police station in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. It was another one of those temporary expo um, exposures. Uh, Brett Angstrom called me up. He said, George, you've got to see this in his <laughs> best excited way. George, you've got to get out here. And we, we talked to the owner, and he thought we were crazy, but I brought my ladder. and. We had over 200 years worth of glacial lake history. And here, here it is. It was raining. It was November. It was really cold. And it wasn't raining, maybe right, right when that photo was taken. But I, I was, and I volunteered to do the ladder. Because some of this stuff, they just dug it out. And some of this silt and clay was popping off the face because it wasn't stable. They were about to build a retaining wall, but we got in there before they did. I had two days. Um, um, I think it's is it five or ten? Two, three, four. Every five uh, bars or years, I put in a, a golf tee. 
to keep track of it. And we measured the thickness of all the summer and winter layers. And it actually mapped up, mapped, matched up very well with the other sites we had in the, in the uh, uh, Linsky River Valley. So that one's gone too, never to be seen again. <laughs> and just so you know, the next time you go to downtown Montpelier, uh, this is out in front of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. This is artificial fill of some sort, and then I believe some stream deposits. And this is our clay, silt and clay. I couldn't really do anything with it, but there's your lake deposits down underneath our feet in the valley uh, bottoms around here. So there's cool stuff to be seen. Uh, there's some clay on U.S. Route 2, oh, okay. a spot that has repeatedly slumped over the years. And just as an aside, there were some pretty large brickyards in uh, much of the Winiski Valley. Waitsfield, Essex, and Waterbury, those are some of the historic sites, but we had them in Plainfield, Marshfield, Cabot. Um, Anything up in Southern Woodbury? Anybody know of a brickyard in, a, in your older history here? You might not have had one, but they're all over. It's supposed to be in North, North, North Towns. Okay, that makes sense. That makes There's sense. one up in Craftsbury. I've seen that one. Yeah, or I've seen the site. I've been shown the site and seen some old bricks there. Yeah. So they were. It was once a widespread cottage and larger industry. Right. Right. So we've taken a tour of Woodbury, and we haven't explained everything, but I think this is probably a good stopping point. But um, maybe as you as you travel around and as you dig in your gardens and all, maybe this will um, give you some background. Um, after a minute, I will go to a slide that has some references and stuff, but I um, wondered if, if folks have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. Yeah, so all these dump truck-sized rocks strewn about Woodbury, um, how far might they have traveled? They just come off the nearby, the nearby the like the one in my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that just got uh, sheer off of the, the granite quarry, or did it travel miles? If it's a piece of granite, it yep. probably came from the next granite mountain to your north. Right. Oh. However, we have seen boulders. Not one in a hundred, it's probably one in a thousand, but they stand out because they're different. We see different boulders here and there that clearly come from outside Vermont even. Oh. There's some, some nice boulders, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, the, the metamorphic rock, that have been traced back to the Precambrian rocks in Quebec, wow. and, which makes sense. And so they're called glacial erratics when, when they've been moved from their local rock onto some new rock. Uh, up in Craftsbury, there's a very particular granite up there, the, the bullseye granite of Craftsbury. Has anybody ever seen that? It's, yeah, yeah. It's very distinctive. And it occurs as bedrock in a very small area. But roughly south of there, maybe it's south and a little bit west, I forget the exact direction, um, the boulders are scattered for miles. And we know they go back there. It's like putting the jigsaw puzzle back there. They're, they're that color. They just, they just go right there to that one spot in Craftsbury. So when somebody can find a unique type of boulder and, and use it as a tracer, it's very useful. But 99% of the boulders come from within probably 10 miles to your north. And um, immediately to the south of every one of our granite hills, like um, okay, where, yeah, here's the, here's the quarries there. Here's your big granite quarries. There's granite boulders all over here. And they're, they're from here. But you've got other scattered bodies. So, what part of town are you in? Uh, right under the quarry. You just had your thumb on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's their I think fault. we figured that one out. <laughs> and granite seems to be particularly good at making big boulders because at times 
the fractures that break it up in the bedrock are very widely spaced. That's what the quarry people want. They want to get, they don't want the finely broken up granite that they get in the upper parts of the rock. They want to get down a ways. Well, the glaciers also scoured and plucked at the high peaks. This is the exception to saying that streams largely shaped our landscape because the glaciers, yeah, they, they shaped it. They scoured away all any loose soil, any kind of rotten rock that they could get their fingers on, the glaciers just plowed it all away and tore away at the bedrock a fair bit, too. Um, there was an old study, and I don't know if it's any good anymore, but the thought was that, that New England had been lowered on average, just average, for whatever good averages are, for something like three feet or so by the glaciers coming and going. And I forgot to mention, they came and went many times in that last couple million years. But anyway, I worked that in at the end. So, other questions? Yes? Uh, on, on an earlier slide, you were showing uh, little purple X's that went from um, Valley Lake to Sabin Pond, but mm -hmm. there wasn't anything connecting Greenwood Lake to Valley Lake or Dog Pond. And, and we, we live on Greenland Lake, and we know that we can kayak across the lake, and we can walk on that neck of land from Greenland Lake to Dog Pond, and they're really connected. And so I was kind of surprised that there wasn't any sort of visual connection from from Greenwood to Dog Pond. Actually, I think there is. I live on Dog Pond, and I've gone through that cut lots of times. And that the esker continues just for maybe a hundred yards or so into Greenwood Lake. Okay, I didn't well, see I it on that. I may have missed something. I may have missed something. Yeah, I think a map with those all the red on the red lines, right? Is that the esker? No. Yeah, the so one of the largest Okay. Yeah. So Greenwood. Yeah, so there's nothing connecting Dog Pond to Greenwood there, and I'm kind of surprised about that because well, I didn't see, see it. They're yeah, so right close. There. there could be something. Yeah, there is one right by where that lowest lobe of Greenwood Lake comes down. So you got something yeah. in there? Yeah, there's one right next to that. Oh, wow. yeah. Do you know, is it on the northwest or southeast? It's, south, it's on the southeast of Greenwood. Like a ridge of sand and gravel, you think? Yeah, yeah. right. Oh, I'll have to get up there and check it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, other questions? I have a question about the esters. Like, yeah, yeah. I've just been confused about the, the water running underneath, and I would think it would be washing stuff out, so why is that mound? Why? Well, it was washing stuff out. However, it was carrying, I didn't bring the right slides for this, but imagine a river flowing with a heavy load of sediment in it. Okay, it's in flood, and sand and gravel is just being tumbled along, and just the water's moving so fast that this, it's just churning with sediment, moving things of all sizes, including boulders. And imagine you could just shut the water off suddenly and deposit all of that stuff. And you can't really do that with a stream, but with a subglacial stream, all you have to do is the ice has to just shift a little bit and it can shut off the source. And all that sand and gravel that was in motion just stops. It's like a kid's game, you know, like everybody stop, freeze. And it just goes And so it's a pile of sand and gravel, but it's surrounded by ice. And if the flow doesn't pick up again and the ice melts, um, it's going to be left as more stuff than the glacial ice around it had sediment in it, but it settles way down. And the pile of huge pile of sand and gravel in the middle ends up standing up as a in in relief. 
So, yeah, yeah you need, we need an animation to see that. Right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be good to have like a, a cartoon version? I'm sure that um, uh, Nova or Nature could do a really good job on this, but I don't think they have. Okay, other questions? Yes? On one of your first slides with the temperatures, um, um, yeah. over over ages and ages. Yeah. That midline is that an average of 32 Fahrenheit, and then the then it gets. Sometimes it's present day average. Mm -hmm. On that one, I don't know for sure. Like uh, roughly, how cold were we talking back when there was this? Best best way for me to answer that is to go to another slide. Skip a bunch of stuff that I didn't show you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think it would help. <laughs> so, let's see. All right, we'll go on. I'm going to start with this. This is like. Oh, that one's too obscure. Let's, let's start with this. This is the last five and a half million years showing uh, global temperature based on the ice core data that they have, the Vostok ice core. Um, and so five million years to the present. And I think this zero is supposed to be some sort of uh, approximately present day um, average or mid 20th century average is often what they're using. And this shows you how the temperature was a bit above that until, depending on how you decide to count it, about three to two and a half million years ago when it started dropping. And this is the glacials coming and going. There, there's over two dozen glacial events that happened largely, to a great extent, worldwide in the last couple million years. Mm -hmm. So we used to think there were four. That was, you know, the, you know, the, the, um, the marine records and the ice core records really added a lot to that. So the climate fluctuated a lot. And, and then we're down to the present day, right down in here somewhere. Um, but I've got a more detailed slide to show that, to answer your question. So that's the one you asked me about. Right. And I think that's present day average, um, but I don't really know. But this one, if you ignore all the wiggles and just look at the black line, which is the, the best fit line through here, um, from 12,000 years ago to the present, um, and with a detail for the last 2,000 years, because it's impossible to show otherwise, this zero line is the mid 20th century average. Mm -hmm. So it was warming. There's that 10,000 years before present. There, there, here's our warming and then fluctuating around. And then in the last 2,000 years, here's your same black line and fluctuating around. That's probably the medieval warm period. That's the little ice age. And then boom, here we are today. And we're off and running. And that's 2004. And it's only up since then. You need a newer graph. Um, so, does that sort of answer yeah. the question? Yeah. So, we haven't seen temperatures like we're getting today for a long time. We can, I can, we can go back far enough in Earth history so we had temperatures as warm as today. But it wasn't really the same Earth. The ocean circulation pattern was completely different. There's no, the continents were in totally different places. It, it was just not the same place. Um, you know, no time uh, in the last uh, several million years have, have, have we been in the time that we seem to be moving towards right now. So, um, maybe one last question, and I'll be happy to continue after people have a chance to stretch and go on your way if you want. But, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I was reading um, Susan, Moore, uh, Susan Sawyer's book about um, 
that she wrote for this area big for the land trust. Um, oh, I knew she was working on that. Yeah, I she seen it. finished it a few years ago. But the um, she mentioned in there that that after the ice left, there was no life at all in this area. Like no plant life, no animal life, barren. So when I was I was just thinking about that, and I said, okay, where? And then things started to recolonize with the warmer temperatures. So was it wind that brought in? You know, seeds and things from the south, or, or what were their memories that sprung back from before the you know three million years? It was everything. Okay. And um, it's not the exact same thing, but um, I was in Iceland looking at glacial moraines right up against the ice, and I was my wife and I were standing on a, a moraine of recording where the ice was the previous year. And it's a maritime climate, it's very moist, it's very warm, but there was pioneer vegetation on that moraine. And as the life followed the ice back, it didn't lag. You know, I mean, there, was, there were, have been seeds dispersing on the ice. And in places that are moist enough, you go to coastal Alaska, that wasn't us, but go to coastal Alaska and there's forests growing on some of the glacial ice on some of those glaciers. Some of them. But it, that takes a moist, warm climate to pull that yeah. off and, yeah. and a special place to also have a glacier there that is emitted melting. But, um, so there wouldn't have been forests on the glacial ice here, but the landscape probably pretty rapidly God, and we have pollen cores recording this. Uh, I can show you all this stuff. I thought I was running out of time. Okay, uh, Matt Peters uh, shared this slide with me. So here, we, here he is up in Quebec, modern day. They went on a backpacking trip up in northern Quebec. And maybe, uh, Paul, does, have you seen terrain like this? At sure, all? yep. Okay, this is vegetated terrain, much more recently deglaciated than us. I don't know, but probably 8,000 years or less since it's so far to the north. I, I don't know what the people up there have determined. So this is several thousand years worth of um, revegetation, maybe. Um, but you, you've got all sorts of vegetation, but the soils are still developing. You're, you're, you've got a scattered, maybe taiga-type vegetation, scattered um, spruce, black spruce, jack pine, maybe. Tamarack. Tam tamarack, even? Okay. All right. But you're not going to have big, vast forests. Um, and why that area is open and how long it's been open, I'm not sure. In the first couple thousand years after the uh, ice retreated, the landscape would have dramatically vegetated. The, uh, the, ice, the uh, pollen records in bogs and lakes show that. But it did take time, because you got to build up enough of a soil for whatever plant, animal communities to, to get going. But, so we had forest, uh, certainly scattered forest, within 2,000 years, but I can't remember exactly how quickly. Well, I think we should probably stop at this point. I'd be happy to answer more individual questions, though. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you.